I want to start with two big picture issues if you're on a self-taught learning to draw journey. The biggest problem with both of these is that so often they're not given any consideration that it's not even realized that the first is not true and the second is true. Let's start with the first one. And that is, if I'm learning to draw, I am not an artist and I am not producing artworks. I am someone who is learning to draw. And that's not a value statement. That's a simple statement of fact. But it's important to understand this because if I realize I'm not an artist producing artworks, but I'm someone learning to draw, then when I sit down, I'm not expecting to produce an artwork at the end. I'm someone who's learning to draw and I expect to have the sorts of things at the end of my drawing session that are the sort of things that someone learning a skill is going to have. If I'm an artist producing artworks, then my thinking, my process, my inputs are going to be very different to someone who's learning a skill and they're having learning sessions in that skill area. It will be different in the same way it's different if a concert pianist sits down to say, do some rehearsal practice to a 12 year old having their first learn the piano lesson. That's the sort of difference we're looking at because the truth is no one starts to learn a new skill at the end point, even though it's often seen the end point which has inspired us and motivated us. The second important point is one that you probably don't even realize that you need to realize, and that's that if you're in a self-taught learning journey in drawing, that you are not just learning to draw, but you are also your teacher. I'm not your teacher. I'm not seeing your work. I'm not able to give you specific direction that's linked to your level of achievement. Now, I am a trained teacher, although a high school teacher, not an art teacher. But I'm still not your teacher. I am a resource for you to use, but that is not the same thing. My videos are a resource that you can choose to watch or not watch, in the same way a teacher will choose textbooks or other resource materials or subject matter for a class to learn. But the bottom line is, if I'm beginning to learn to draw and I'm navigating this journey myself, then any role that a teacher would have had in that I need to manage myself as best I can. And while I may not be able to do all of them, if I'm at least aware that I bear that responsibility as well, I can hopefully do some of them. This next point is if I'm beginning to learn to draw, I need to remember that I need to start at a simple level. And I mustn't let enthusiasm for a particular subject to draw carry me away. If I'm starting to learn to draw, there's no point trying to draw the Musée de Louvre or whatever buildings really grab my attention and interest if I can't master how to draw a simple cottage first. There's a sound educational reason why if we learn the piano, we start with pieces with names such as jumping frogs rather than a Beethoven concerto. Because even if my goal is to play a Beethoven concerto, I'm going to get there a lot faster if I master jumping frogs first and then I master more complex pieces all the way to the concerto that I dream of playing. But if I keep playing concertos badly, I'll end up becoming very good at playing badly. And it's the same with drawing. If I draw things that are too advanced, my drawings can have weaknesses that I'm not even at a level where I can see them clearly and therefore I keep making them and I reinforce all these unhelpful habits in my drawing practice and process. So we need the self-control to start with appropriate subjects and to stay with them until we can fundamentally do them well and then move on. This next point is another trap for the beginning drawer and that's that it's best to limit the sort of subject that we draw and I would advise the sort of subjects that the thought of drawing most motivated us to start to draw. Because the truth is, we can draw anything at all. And we may have the sort of interest in drawing and in drawing material that I want to draw a hundred different things all at once. But if we want to consolidate lessons learned quickly at the start, I do that by having a limited number of different subjects that I wrestle with, that I grapple with, that I try and draw. Albeit, 
for an appropriate level of difficulty for where I'm up to. In fact, I think it's worth working out what is it that I most want to learn to draw? What is it that most inspires me? And for all sorts of valid reasons, to stick with that at the start. And also, what material do I most want to be able to draw in? I shouldn't draw with pencil if I want to draw with ink as my goal. And I shouldn't draw with either of them if I want to draw with charcoal or pastels, if I want to use watercolour washes or whatever. Because every different material to draw with has its own challenges, but has its own opportunities, has its own joys and frustrations. And at the start, when I'm just learning to draw, again, I want to be able to consolidate gains as rapidly as possible. Because I simply can't learn well everything all at once. And again, there's an element of self-control and patience needed in this, not to get excited and carried away when I see a wonderful pastel drawing or a beautiful charcoal work, if I'm in the middle of trying to learn to draw well in ink. This next bit of advice follows on from the last one, and that is that at the start of our drawing journey, it's best to restrict ourselves to one area so that we can go deep in that one area, consciously go deep, consciously learn skills well and learn as many skills for that thing as we possibly can. Because when we do this, what we learn, as well as learning how to draw, is we learn how to go deep. We learn how to start with a basic level of skill. We learn to improve those skills. We learn then to add in new skills that we also consolidate and build in together. And that process of learning is an incredibly important skill to learn. Not all the skills we need to learn in learning to draw are learning to draw. A lot of them will be learning how to learn. If I play around with lots of different art materials and subjects, I end up going very shallow in a lot of areas. And all I learn how to do is how to go shallow. Far more helpful for the long term to learn how to go deep. This next point is simple, but I really need to remember that as is the case with learning any skill, learning is work. No matter how much I enjoy what I'm learning, no matter how motivated I am to learn and to use and improve, it is still work. And at times that work will be effort, that will require perseverance. And I need to persevere from the wise choices I make as my own teacher about what I'm doing. Because as my own teacher, I do have to put some work and effort into working out what I'm doing, the best way of doing it, of researching the possibilities so that I can make the best choices. So I need to be mentally prepared for this. This next point, as a beginner in learning anything, I need to have a very self-forgiving attitude towards mistakes. But I do think that art, and in particular learning to draw, is perhaps more challenging than most areas, simply because if we make a mistake, it's still there at the end. If I'm playing the piano and I play a note or two notes or 10 notes wrong, after I've finished, those notes are gone. The good, the bad, all of them are gone. They're not there to haunt me or for other people to see. But if I'm drawing, and particularly if I'm drawing in ink, then any lines which, well, aren't quite right, are still there at the end. And that can be very confronting, particularly if I'm a bit of a perfectionist. In fact, the fear of making mistakes for some personalities, and in my experience, in fact, for many personalities, can even become quite paralyzing. I have to realize that mistakes never look as bad as when I first make them. And that so many mistakes, even when I draw directly in pen, I can actually, if you like, cover up or hide or at least reduce the impact of. And that's a skill that I need to develop. I only develop them when I embrace my mistakes and work them into my drawing and learn how I can do that. But even wrong lines that I can't really mitigate against, they give me a focus for my next drawing. They help direct me to where I need to put more effort, more focus, perhaps do some drawing sessions where I particularly work on those things that are causing me so much problem at this point in time. Mistakes, we need to see them as our friends. If I'm a self-taught artist, 
then the chances are that probably the most easily accessible, affordable, and possibly even the only materials available are online, such as this video. What I need to remember is that just because something looks and sounds or is even presented as a how to draw video, doesn't mean they're all the same. It may not even fundamentally be helpful. And some teaching might be okay for someone else at a different stage of their drawing development, but not for where I'm at. I need to be discerning with what I'm watching and what I let influence my drawing learning journey. Some videos are very entertaining, but they may not actually be teaching anything I need to know. Other videos may be very good, but they're not teaching things that will progress my drawing journey. They may even distract me, or they may be unnecessary for where I'm going, where I'm heading, my end point, and therefore they may simply distract me and use my time away from where I'm wanting to go. So we need to choose the resources and particularly the videos that we watch carefully. This next one relates to the last one, but it's simply to emphasize the fact that the most entertaining how to draw teaching videos may actually not be the best teaching videos. Now, a good teaching video shouldn't be boring. A good teacher shouldn't be boring. But we can only have one focus at the one time that we use to make our decisions on. And if my main focus is entertainment, then I will make decisions based on what will be the most entertaining. If my focus is on learning process, then I will make decisions in the end based on the best learning process outcomes. Of course, entertainment is great. I watch lots of videos for entertainment as well. But if I'm learning to draw, if I have limited time to put to learning to draw and to using resources, then I need to stay very focused and make sure that I'm choosing the resources and particularly the videos to watch that will enable me to develop my drawing skills as strongly, as confidently, and as rapidly as possible. And if these are helpful, please hit the like button right now and help me out. This next one's really quick, but that is if we're learning to draw, really if we're learning to do anything, if we can have a learning buddy, that's often a very helpful and a very encouraging thing. Someone who's also learning to draw. Not just do we get to show each other our drawings and perhaps share the highs and lows of the drawing process experience, but we can also tip each other off to resources that we've found, such as videos that we've watched, that we have found to be really helpful. Even in quite different expressions of creativity, there is still a lot of overlap that can make having someone to share the journey with very encouraging. We talked about the need to be our own teacher very early on, but as well as that meaning that we need to choose our own work and set our own work, we also need to mark our own work. This is extremely important and it's really easy to overlook. In finishing a drawing, it's easy to get caught up with the enthusiasm and the promise of the next drawing. But it's very important that we mark our work. And the term I prefer to use is critique. That we look at it and we assess it and we work out where has it succeeded in what we are hoping to have happen and where has it not succeeded because these things give us the information we need to continue to plot our learning journey the things that we've done well at particularly if we've done well with them consistently possibly we can move on to material that doesn't involve them as much and we can actually introduce new elements that will stretch us more equally areas that we can see are weak, we know that we need to focus on those and maybe we need to choose some exercises that almost entirely focus on those so that we can bring these ones up to the same level as the strong ones. This is not about condemning ourselves or being judgmental. It's about giving ourselves the focus we need to maximize our improvement as we go on. This next point is about a way of understanding the drawing process that I have found extraordinarily helpful. And that is to think of drawing as like translation work, translating one language into a different language. When we draw, we have a reference of some sort, whether it's a photo, whether it's real life in front of us, whether it's something in our imagination, we have a place that we're going to that we're using to create what we put on the paper. What we're referencing 
that's one language. What's going to end up on the paper is the other language and it's our creative thinking that will perform the translation and this creative thinking is so vital. It's one of the most vital parts of the drawing process but it's often not talked about there's no evidence or explanation of it in so many videos. This is what tells me what sort of lines or marks I want to place on the paper, where I place them and for what purpose I place them. I'm not copying something in the photo, I'm not copying from my reference, I'm translating. There will be elements of my reference that I can't possibly copy with any precision. Think of foliage on a tree trying to draw with a fine line of pen. I can't draw all those leaves. I have to translate that reality into something else that I then express on my paper to say the same thing but in a different way. And if we understand this idea of translating rather than copying, then it frees me up to much greater freedom and versatility in the options I have available for me to draw, which is always going to give me a better outcome. I've just discovered a new camera angle in the backyard that I've never used before for this next point. And if I'm beginning to learn to draw, this is so crucial to appreciate right from the start. And that is that how I observe when I'm drawing is fundamentally different in how I have observed in my life up till now. It's such an easy thing to trip over because the way I've learned to observe for most of life, most of the time, is going to be inadequate for how I need to observe to draw. And so often when our drawings disappoint us, when they're not looking right, we're thinking that I'm lacking technical skills in some way. I need to learn to draw the lines better or differently. When really the problem is, I never saw the things I needed to see in my reference to be able to put them on the paper with any credibility. I don't need to learn drawing skills, I need to learn observation skills, but I don't realize I need to learn observation skills. I have a short playlist of four or five videos on observation skills for drawing if you think this might be a problem for you. This one now may seem difficult because in practice it may seem less satisfying than what you want to do. But it goes back to that earlier point that if we're learning to draw, we're learning, we're not producing artworks. But this point is that it's more helpful to have shorter but more frequent drawing sessions than longer ones. Because at the very start, it's really not very helpful to maybe once a week have a two or three hour drawing session because invariably our drawings are going to have a lot of issues in them that a more experienced drawer could spot. What that means is I'm spending hours and time and energy producing something that's fundamentally flawed for all sorts of reasons I'm simply not experienced enough to understand, possibly even to see. But if I spend, say, 20 minutes every day doing a short, relatively fast drawing exercise, and see, I'm thinking exercise, not artwork, where I can see easily and quickly whether I'm able to do a certain aspect of drawing, and where over three or four drawings, I can see whether it was chance or whether I've actually understood it and I can move on to something else confidently, then this becomes a very effective way to progress my drawing at the level of my developing ability. And in any given session, I'm not spending a lot of time either drawing things I don't need to draw because I, I've mastered those, or drawing things that are really such a problem, I need to go right back to basics with them rather than trying to incorporate them in a whole drawing that they end up pulling down. If I can isolate into as simple and short a drawing as possible, the individual skills that I need to practice, then I can master them much more rapidly. Now, it may not be as satisfying to produce a small, simple diagram that really is obviously more a diagram than a drawing. But if my goal, if my aim is to learn to draw, it's a much faster way to get there. This next one is going to seem a bit tough for some of you, but when we're starting to learn to draw, it's important to avoid copying the drawings of other artists. It's very tempting to do because it's actually far easier to get a nice looking drawing by copying another drawing. 
And the reason for that is, is that it's much easier to copy something directly than it is to create it originally ourselves. I talked a moment ago about the translation process that takes place between reference and drawing. When we copy someone's drawing, they've already done all of that observation and creative thinking and translation and working out what marks to put where. All I'm doing is looking at their marks and copying their marks as closely as possible in my drawing. Now, that does develop skills. Copying is a skill. And if I want to learn to copy, then copying other artworks will teach me to do that. But if my aim is to learn to do my own original drawings, not just will copying other artworks not take me there, it will take up all the time that will enable me on a different journey to get there. And it will often discourage me because I will feel like when I copy another drawing, I'm really talented, look at this. But then when I go to do my own drawings, I may not even know where to start. And this can be confusing and discouraging. The important thing to remember is that copying of another drawing, besides actually being a copyright infringement, is a different process to doing our own drawings. And we need to focus on what we want to learn for the end place we want to get to. We're nearly there, point 16. If I'm working from a photo as a beginner, it's really easy to think that my goal is to copy the photo as closely as possible that a successful drawing will look as much like the photo as possible. And this is a fundamental error. Photos, as a certain creative medium, have their own strengths and weaknesses. And my aim as an artist should be to capture the strengths and to mitigate the weaknesses, but also to use this as a, I like to think of as a springboard for my own creative interpretation. Nobody's going to be comparing my drawing to the reference. My drawing will stand alone. I don't want to be limited by weaknesses in the reference. And if there are ways I can tweak what I'm doing, if I can crop the photo, if I can leave things out, if I can add things or rearrange where things are, if I can change the values, make some things darker and some things lighter, I might increase the visual drama as I think of it, or the visual tension by changing angles of certain key elements. All of these things are part of the creative process that as an artist, we're going to end up wanting to do. And so we need to start practicing that too. I see many drawings where it's obvious they've been copied from photos because they've managed to capture the flatness of a photo. We want to learn to go beyond those weaknesses so that our drawings look more three-dimensional than a photo ever could. This second last point is again the way we think. And that's it's far more useful when I'm drawing, particularly drawing with pencil or pen, of thinking of drawing with marks rather than lines. It's natural to think of lines because if we go back to our childhood experience, we often first came across drawing in simple children's drawings, in simple drawings we did at school, and cartoons we read or we watched on TV, which are often very much a line outline of fairly simplified shapes that we adopt in our own school drawing, but continue as we draw, if we continue to draw, as we're older. And even if there's a big gap and we restart as adults, this is often our experience that we go back to in our thinking. A focus on lines tend to end up with a lot of outlining, which can look very two-dimensional, very cartoon-like, which is not surprising given the possible origins of this thinking in our mind. Far better is to think of marks Marx gives us an infinite range of possibilities of ink shapes to put on our paper. Now, some of these marks will be lines, but it's a much broader category of thinking, which opens up a much greater range of possibilities. And that's always going to be helpful. This final point, I feel, is possibly the most important. And it does flow on in terms of it's connected with the way we think. And it's also connected with thinking marks rather than lines, because this is a way of thinking when we observe rather than a way of thinking when we actually do the drawing part. And it's when we look at a reference, it's usually more important, more helpful to not so much look at what we're seeing, but to look at the effect of what we're seeing. And then when we draw, not to try and draw the object, but to try and draw the effect of what we're seeing. And 
if we're thinking marks when we go to draw rather than line, we have far more visual resources that we're thinking about and that we end up developing at our fingertips that we can use to create the effect. And I think this is most easily understood in terms of leaves, of foliage, where we can see all this detail. We know all the leaves, and yet to draw, it's overwhelmingly complex. Instead of trying to draw the leaves, which ends up in a very unrealistic looking effect, and often it's simply a deterioration into a leaf pattern, I need to see the overall visual effect of all of these leaves and work out how can I capture that effect on my paper. Trees almost demand in most cases that we draw the effect of the foliage, not the actual detail. We spend so much time thinking about technical skills, but so much of learning to draw successfully is actually about how we see and how we think and then the creative decisions that we make before we put any mark on the paper. We need to develop great patience that we don't rush into the actual drawing before we really know what we're drawing. G'day, I'm Stephen Travers. I hope this was very helpful. This really is so many of my videos crammed into one. Every one of these points has its own video, has several videos for it in many cases. But I wanted to compress them all together for absolute beginners. And I hope that it saves you a lot of time and grief and leads you into a lot more joy in the art of drawing a lot sooner. But look, whatever you draw, however you draw it, however you learn it, however it turns out, make sure you have fun. I'll see you next time. Bye.